Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video is well overdue, right? Uh, subscribers of mine have been asking for a very long time, could I make a video on medieval arrows and how they were made in the medieval times? And also, how do I make my own arrows for my personal use? So, without further ado, let's get cracking. So, before you even begin to make the arrows, you got to wonder, where'd they get the timber from? or the lumbar, as they call it here in the Americas and Canada. Aspen, ash, cedar, poplar, all of these different woods. Now, I was very lucky, fortunate when I was a kid, around about nine, I moved out of the inner city that I was born into, out into the countryside where there was ancient woodland there, out in Staffordshire. And I just used to play Robin Hood all of the time. But what I noticed, there were lots of trees there that were low bound, they had a low main branch, and from it every year grew straight, arrow straight bits of wood, which I harvested and used as, as makeshift arrows myself as this kid running around. What I didn't realize is that's what they were for. These are century old trees that were still being harvested either for arrow shafts by the locals or simply to make fencing, yeah? And I never realized until I was reading recently that they bought arrows that have been uh, coppiced, some of them with skin on, some of them with skin off, that's peeling back the bark. But of course, you've got to have a main supply of timber as well. And one thing they did was they bought, they made it into boards. They could actually saw and then they could cut, couldn't they? Watch my fingers now. <laughs> I'm absolutely useless at this. I really am. But they would actually cut until you had a square section. Just so happens that I've got one here that I prepared earlier. Actually, I cut it on a, on a saw. This is your square section. But how do you get that to that? Right? And these are from the same pieces of timber. So I'll show you. What you need is what I understand is called a shooting jig. Now this is just two pieces of timber. You chamfer the one edge on the other, put a stop. Nothing fancy with mine. I've seen these where they have been uh, polished and all of that. Nope, this is pure functional for Kevin. So you put side in, so you've got uh, four sides. You then run any old plane down it and turn it and keep on going. Each time you come to an edge, simply turn it, shave him down and keep on shaving him down until you have, I think I've got one. This one here still got some of the parts where you can see where it's been shaved down on this jig. Once you get to that stage, Get yourself a piece of wood, drill a hole through it, cut it in half, get your sandpaper, put it together like that, and you can start to shape. But of course, if we're going back to the medieval times, of course they could have made a jig like this, no problems at all. We know they had planes, there's no problems in that. But they didn't have sandpaper the way we know it. Now back in my native England, they would have caught the fish what I've always called a dogfish, member of the shark family. Dogfish or rock salmon skin is perfect sandpaper. It is brilliant. Now I've tried, I can't get any. Also, sandstone, piece of sandstone, bore a hole through it and you can simply shave him, get him nice and round. Look at that. Now that is perfect, right? And you can make an arrow from this. No problems. Now, if you compare that to a modern day shaft, people will go, oh, look, he's got a bit of this or he's got a bit of that. These were either for hunting or for killing people. These aren't your competition arrows. It's what I call ammunition. So as you can imagine, I don't spend all day long shaping arrow shafts. No, I buy mine. I get them imported into here from Canada from South Wales Archery. Thanks guys, they do a good job. As you can see, there's not much difference between the ones I've just made overnight and the ones that I've purchased. The ones I've made are a bit thicker and longer. And I can shape these into parallel sided, 
barreled. I could even make them heavy at one end and bobtailed at the other where you have a little bit of a bulbous piece for the, for the knock. But what I'm going to show you is how I make uh, the, the horn knocks because I concentrate mainly on horn knocked arrows. So, first of all, a little jig like this, this is nothing. It's two screws and an old bit of wood with some holes drilled into it. But as you'll see here, this is an arrow I've been working on. You stick him in, you tighten him up. Now the groove cut in to, for the horn insert, they used to have a small saw. I've got one. This is a historical piece. It's hundreds of years old. It's a small saw. Butchers had them, surgeons had them, and so did carpenters. And as you can see, I have already very carefully cut down a hole all the way down or a slot to take in the uh, horn knock. Now, do yourself a favor, when you buy these, uh, they're quite thick, sand it down. Make this to the shape of the groove. Make sure he slots in nicely. Don't force it because you'll then put pressure onto the arrow and he'll eventually split. Now, all you have to do is glue him in, some resin glue. I used to call it in England, Mr. Harold and Mr. Dice, Harold Dice, and it will never move. Now, let's trim this down. Once the glue is dry, to trim this down, because it's thin, you can either cut it with a blade and snap it, or if you have a very, very fine uh, jigsaw, like a hobby jigsaw, you can just cut him through dead easy. And once you've, you've got him in and there's just a narrow ridge, I've got one here I've been working on actually. Yeah, here's one, he's pretty much done. So, put him in my jig, get him to the position where he doesn't vibrate. Now, make your mark halfway. So the knock is going across yeah, the, uh, the grain. Make yourself just the tiniest little bit of a V if you can. Now the reason you're doing that, first of all, make sure you're in the right place. But also, when you bring in either your small saw or if you're doing it the modern way, get yourself three hacksaw blades. Some people say two, I say three, but then tape them together. Otherwise, as you're sawing down, they actually separate. Another trick is as you put this into the little groove you've made, Put your thumbnail against it and just very slowly fetch him down. And you want to take this down to about an eighth of an inch. I don't think any two of my knocks are the same. Now don't forget what the knock is for. It's where your bowstring goes, yeah? Just for those people who may have been wondering. So you take him down, as I say, to about an eighth of an inch. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, my secret weapon. Bit of sandpaper. Just smooth what you've done. Sandpaper today, in those days, it would have been fish skin. But now, most importantly, a needle file, a nice little round needle file, and take him down, all the way down. Just a little tip, don't put your thumb in front of the needle file. If you do, you'll have to take a break to stop the bleeding. So let's take it out of there so I can show you a little bit better. So there is the basic knock. So now we're in there, we're going to round it. Completely round the knock. So it sits in there with the the bowstring, and it doesn't cut into your bowstring. Now, I bet there'll be lots of people out there saying, no, you don't do it like that, you do it like this, but actually, Kevin does it like this, and he has done for decades. 
and my arrows have served me very well. Thank you very much. So I'm just finishing off a knot here, making it nice and smooth, rounded off at the ends. Now, the next phase from this is, of course, fletching. And I've got an arrow that I fletched this morning. I was just getting it ready, just put the point on. Uh, there it is, the nice knock, all nice and smooth for the bowstring. And the fletchings, the top one here is the grey goose. That's the cock feather, so I know which way to put it on the bow. And now, this is straight out of the jigs, so let me explain. In order to get the fletching sitting correctly on the bow, there's got to be a jig. Now, I've seen a reenactment where they've made wooden jigs, but it's still basically the same as a modern jig. These are Sherwood jigs, I've had them for years, but you've got to imagine these are the goose fletchings. So they were gathered in tacks. I do believe Henry V, was it? Every goose in England had to surrender so many goose feathers. All the facts and figures are there. Uh, but to get these from this onto the arrow, it's quite interesting. Here we have one fletching. Curved slightly to the right, which I like. And I've already got a measurement on my jig. So I'm gonna find just where it thins out a little bit. You can use a knife. I'm using scissors. They had knives and scissors, just the same as us. Seven inches, I'm measuring these, which is quite long, but it's what I use. So once I've found me seven inch, roughly, in it goes, and I'm gonna cut him. And I've been told, oh, you can use a wire, you can do this, you can do that. I've already always used just a sharp pair of scissors. And you go down a little bit, down a little bit more, and a little bit more, until you cut off at the end. Now this is actually too big, but it works perfectly for the jig. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna undo the first jig and show you what's been going on. There's already one um, white goose feather on there. So let me just take him out for you so you can see. There's the gray goose, there's the white. Now we've got to put the third and final one on. And I'll show you how to repair when these uh, feathers get a little bit damaged when you're doing the, the jig laying because these are so long. So let's uh, put him back in. Now these jigs are great. It's set perfectly. But now I'm gonna turn in one clip and that gives me the place for the next white fletching to be set. It's, it's not nice crushing the, fe the fletchings there but it's how we have to do it. A little trick is to keep just a tiny little bit of tape around the end there. Nothing special, just a little bit of masking tape just to stop it from slipping sometimes. Then, having marked this already, this is the start point. You put him in, make sure he's level have a pin standing by, get your tube of disgusting glue. This is just simple white adhesive. Run a bead of it along. Not too much, but make sure that there is enough to glue this beggar to the arrow shaft. There he goes. Now in the medieval times I understand they had lots of different glues. Even glues made from plants like the bluebells. Put him in, set him down. Now because he's so long, he sticks out at the front and that's what the pin's for. You simply pin him straight. 20 minutes, that'll be set and I will then have an arrow ready to trim down the fletchings a bit more if I need to, and to steam out.
the damaged fletchings. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to steam the fletchings. If you look at these, these fletchings, these feathers, they're very tired. This has been through the target a few times. So what you do is you boil the kettle, but now be very, very careful. Take the lid off. As the kettle begins to boil, you hold the fletchings, the feathers, over the steam. And very, very slowly, the steam pushes the feathers back into shape. These are just nicely coming in now. Yep, tightening up rather nicely. That's actually quite nice the way that's turned out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one out of the jig. It's a little bit soon really, but I'm going to do it because you can see where the fletchings have all been rucked up a little bit. See on the grey here? And if I just hold that under, ah, oh, that's gone back in. Absolutely perfect. You wouldn't even think that this had been into a jig. So what we're going to do now is we're going to whip this arrow as they call it and here is my magnificent Westminster arrow there but uh, don't forget I'm making ammunition so this is what I'm hoping to achieve just a decent bit of whipping that will last me for years. So before you start the actual whipping process the binding of the fletchings to keep them in place you've got to have a special knot. Now for the knot, let me just tell you, medieval times, goose fletchings. But if you're a princess, maybe swan fletchings or peacock feathers. Hey, we're just common soldiers, so let's whip this fletch. Make a loop, hold it in place with your thumb. Just lock him in there into the fletchings. Get the beginning of the fletching and put it through your loop. Then hold the loop in place with your thumb, making sure none of it can escape. Once you've done that, you wind him round. Somebody once asked me, do you do it clockwise or anti-clockwise? I haven't got a clue. I just get on and do it. Most importantly though, as you wind him around, just pull your fingernails down on the binding just to tighten this up. Now it can be half an inch in length or it can be like this one just under half an inch I would say but once you reach the base of the feathers the fletchings clamp what you've wound with your finger take the knot pull him up now you've locked the thread it can't come undone but what you do now is you just pull the loop through there is your thread now you can cut it or you can simply bind him in with the rest of it. I like to cut it. Now, once you've done this, nice. You can begin to wind. Now, the professionals will do it at a set distance. Me, I do this by eye. I put him in, turn, put him in, turn, put him in, turn. And I kind of match it with my own eye. Now, I'm normally doing this, I will be honest with you, sat on the settee in the front room watching the telly. I find this quite relaxing. And you can see where you've gone wrong. So you can bring him out, separate the veins there, until eventually you've got a nice little pattern going. Not too tight for me. So we're getting towards the end now, so couple more turns. Any pieces that are sticking out like this from the feathers, just knock them back in and we'll steam him afterwards. Now this, yeah, another one maybe. No, we're on. Right, so we change now. I'll do a couple of loops. Just hold him in place now with my finger so nothing comes undone. Then we need the magic loop which is quite good because I normally lose this and I'm going, oh, where is it? So now you bring the loop down and you wind over it. Bring your fingernails in. Watch you don't catch the 
fletching on the other side with this, which is often easily, quite easily done. It's a bit tricky, but it's important because you're going to seal off all of your fletchings there, all of your windings. It's all going to be done. Right, so that is pretty good. So now I've got to just cut a bit of the string. So just bear with me a second. Putting through the loop. Now with the other two bits, make sure you've got both of them. You bring your thread down and then through. See, I've pulled him through and I've hidden the knot. Push everything down, clamp him down. Now what you can do is you can put a little bit of clear glue over this. Uh, nail varnish some people actually use. And then cut him off pretty good but those fletchings are a bit big for me so just with my eye I'm going to cut down this grey goose just a little bit and there we have it to put the pile on or the point you can use the sharpener you buy these to the right size of your arrow you can then put your pile nice little modern bodkin or you can even put on a medieval style. I glue these on, Mr. Harold and Mr. Dite, a bit of epoxy resin, and then you don't lose him off in the target. And there we have an arrow, ammunition for Kevin. That's simply it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget, like, share, and subscribe. And if you can, turn on that notification button so you know what's coming on down the line. But before I go, I've got to mention to my Patreon members there, Derek Schultz and Chris Holmes. Hey guys, thank you very much and see you all soon. Bye-bye.